let's just sort of go back a little bit. Where did you begin your uh, formal musical training? Can you tell me a bit about your experiences and perhaps in what way it contributed to your development as an artist? I heard a teacher at school, primary school, playing, and I thought that was quite interesting, um, just hearing the music and the fact that people could create music from one instrument. And prior to that, um, my dad taught me how to read music. I started um, with a private piano teacher um, and did sort of grade exams, spent time with one teacher and then I went off to the Yorkshire College of Music and um, carried on with different teachers. Um, how, how was your experience there at the college? I think um, because each teacher was um, very passionate about what they did and they were accomplished performers, um, that was an inspiration in itself. And they also had insight into how to manage different technical problems, um, musical perspectives of how to get something across. Um, and, and all those things helped, if that makes sense. Um, and with young people as well, sometimes there are weeks when you haven't done enough practice and you'd go in and try and coast. And somebody would say, well, this is what you're doing. And they'd give you a demonstration. <laughs> and then they would blaze it as it should be played. And that'd be the wake up call to go and do some more practice. Right. So, so and, and at what point did you then start composing in relation to that? When did, the, when did Phil the composer begin? I think it was, um, I think there's one teacher at school in particular who had a very eclectic kind of outlook and could sing operatic stuff as well as write arrangements of the pop music of the day um, as well as pull together people of different abilities to be in different ensembles and polish it to make it sound musical. And so you just got the idea that you could actually create something from nothing. Um, there was also a church that I went to as well, and there were lots of people making music of different um, cultural origins. And uh, that was also interesting and stimulating. Um, I had friends who played jazz, and I was doing the classical stuff. So it was just interesting to see lots of layers of different things going on that kind of encouraged this spirit of experimentation. And I think that's what got me going in terms of writing things and enjoying this process of starting from nothing to something that's finished and something that could be performed and the excitement of hearing it performed. So, I mean, we were talking, well, you've been talking rather about teaching and music teachers, and I'm sort of of the opinion that I think sometimes even really bad music teachers can still have a very profound influence on the direction and sort of evolution of one's artistic development, even if it's a kind of a rejection of something mm. that you disagree with, for instance. Which teachers in your life do you think had sort of the most profound musical influences on you, would you say? I think the one at high school, 
was very good um, in the sense that there were all these eclectic musical in influences that um, she managed to combine in her kind of outlook and perspective. And she always encouraged people um, of all backgrounds to be involved in things. Um, there was always something going on. Her concerts combined this eclectic uh, musical interest in that there was something for everybody to listen to. And there were always teachers that performed that you wouldn't normally associate with the department um, who were on the staff. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's where I think I got my interest. Um, and then from there on, it was just a question. I think it lay dormant for a while. Um, and came back when GCSE music came into play, where it was very hands-on, where you had listening, performing, composing, and to get teachers up skilled to deliver this, you had to go and do summer schools or CPD and explore how you'd approach certain things when it came to composition. And uh, I think when I came to the class, came, came back to the classroom, I think um, I probably enjoyed it more than the kids did. <laughs> Um, do you, I mean that's interesting that you say that sometimes it draws on uh, African influences, what would you say would be the, the, uh, the sometimes part? Um, it can sometimes be, it can sometimes be soul, it can, I don't know, I wouldn't say soul. It depends. I mean, sometimes it can be African-American. There was a suite for oboe and piano I've written, and the first movement has the influence of a prelude in C by Bach. There's that motif in the left hand and the arpeggio figure in the right hand. But yet you could also link the rhythm of that motif in the left hand to something that feels very minimalistic. There are chords that I would associate with soul music in the middle section of that movement, the first movement of the suite. In another movement, it's called spiritual, so it kind of has perhaps the influence of blues the African-American Negro spiritual um, and the rhythms are derivative of what you'd find in spirituals, blues, etc. The last movement has a very Latin kind of feel because the driving rhythm is essentially calypso in parts and broadly speaking, Latin rhythms in other parts of that movement. So I just called it pulsation. That's really interesting. So your music's drawn from a host of different influences. Some of those influences, I'm assuming, uh, are 
that you do have some sort of heritage connection to. I mean, Western classical music, for instance, I mean, you're English, you live here. Um, is there a difference in the way that you treat the, because you said Latin, I don't know if you have any Latin in you. I don't know, but I did hear a great uncle talk about members of the family perhaps going to work in Cuba, but I didn't pursue that to find out right. who, when, why, what, where. I do like Cuban music. Um, I think it has, it's very sparky, it's, it's, um, it's very soulful, you know, it's full-blooded music, you know, it's really, yeah. I'm just sort of wondering if you feel when you're, I guess, exploring genres that are outside of your immediate cultural heritage, whether you feel a sense that you have to treat those differently from, say, something like Soul, which mm. uh, some composers have sort of said, well, that's sort of what I grew up on, mm. so I feel that kind of in my blood. Do you mm. know what I mean? Yeah. How do you feel about that? I think my interest is ec eclectic. And I think part of that has to do with growing up in an environment where there were lots of people from lots of different nationalities. So through conversation with them, you find out about who they are, their traditions, the food, and inevitably the music. And I have been interested in looking at music from different cultural perspectives from an educational point of view and you have to teach these things you have to do it from a point of integrity because there are children that come from or young people that come from these backgrounds and so they know what is fake and what is authentic and so you call in practitioners who can explain authentically what happens in these traditions and I have found that quite interesting because through looking at other perspectives there's always something that can be found which is similar to another cultural perspective. Does that make sense? Mm, it makes a lot of sense. So it's almost like the, I guess, the kind of cultural milieu that you kind of grew up in, this idea is perhaps has somehow maybe informed your, or perhaps motivated your desire to want to explore these different cultures because you were surrounded by these different cultures. Is that right? I think that's part of it. Um, I think there are some sound worlds which stand out from others that can be stimulating enough for you to want to delve into those and then through those you make a, a journey into something else mm. so you end up discovering quite a lot of things about lots of different perspectives which i think enriches your outlook as opposed to diminishes it Just sort of thinking about these sort of various influences, how do you think that your music differs from the music that you've been influenced by and what aspects do you think have remained? I think because my outlook is eclectic, I think that um, th there are things that I naturally do and com in terms of combining sound worlds. I, I would say I'm a tonalist as opposed to somebody using um, a modern atonal diet for writing music. So I think sometimes rhythmically, sometimes it can be timbrely what I decide to do. Um, I was thinking back to that suite solo steel pan and strings um it had other instruments in there as well um 
I think there was a a movement called Hoover's Song, and we had uh, a tap dancer who was used as an extension of the percussion section of the ensemble. And I would write spaces where he could improvise against what was going on in the general flow of the piece. whistle, kind of like Caribbean carnival style in the introduction. And there was just this opportunity to interact with instruments and the footwork at the start, um, which audience members seem to enjoy, um, and the instrumentalists, because it wasn't something that we're used to seeing. And it was um, the mentor, Paulette, would talk to me, because she's, Paulette um, Brooks, she's very experienced in terms of um, the world of dance. She knows a lot about it and talked to me about what people did in the past and how you could bring that into something like this suite. And it did work. Um, quite an interesting concept to to have that interaction between instrumentalists and a dancer. Do you think that you've managed to successfully integrate your various influences into your musical language? I think so. Um, I don't think it's through having to try very hard. I think it's um, it's about when you address a particular subject. I mean, for instance, London 2012, when I was working on a project then, and I decided to write a suite for solo steel pan and strings. And when it came to getting funding, people were a bit concerned because it seemed that writing something for solo steel pan and strings was risky when I'd seen the air from Bach Suite in D played by um, a steel pan ensemble with strings accompanying very successfully. So I knew that could be done. Um, but in delivering that particular suite, I did some research on Caribbean dances and wanted to create a a suite, a bit like a Baroque suite, and populate it with dance movements that um, may be from Baroque times as well as dance movements from around the Caribbean or African diaspora. And so the first movement I tried to do like French overture style, but overlaid with um, this Jamaican um, dance rhythm called Brookings Party. And there's a song that goes with Brookings Party and that alludes to the proclamation of freedom given by Queen Victoria. Um, but the two things together, you still get that spirit of, um, that sense of uh, magisterial pomp in the dotted rhythms that you get in French Overture. Um, but an extra dimension is added when you have that Brookings party rhythm added. Um, and I think the dance is about um, kings and queens paying homage to each other and things. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting to explore a 
project like that, that's celebrating internationalism, where you have an excuse to um, bring to the table different layers uh, that you might not ordinarily explore because uh, the subject calls for it. So do you think it's important for new music to be challenging? And what do you understand by that term? How do you interpret that? I think new music can be challenging. And I think a good piece of music should um, take people by surprise or, or do something that makes them think. Because um, if you're not making them think, um, perhaps the music isn't, isn't up to much, maybe. Um, I remember doing a, a concert with two other performers and it was music from the Harlem Renaissance and after the concert, some of the lecturers came to ask questions about the lives these musicians had led and what the music would have meant to them, the audiences, and what was happening in the period in time when the music was created that might have been an inspiration for the music to be created. And it was interesting standing back as a performer and listening to that dialogue and hearing that they'd actually taken in what had been performed and were quite intensely kind of entering into dialogue with each other and coming back to us with questions about dates, times, and uh, what was going on. And I, I did think that was a very worthwhile performance in that had we not brought that music to that space, this open university, people might not have heard of that particular period in time and learnt something about how that could relate to the here and now. I think audiences are part and parcel about thinking about the creative process. Um, because instead, if, if you just kind of thinking about ordinary bog standard choral orchestral repertoire, it attracts certain groups of people to come and other people are turned off by it. They won't even come through the door. So it's good to, to think about what might bring in a mix of people who wouldn't normally sit together and listen. And, uh, I thought that the London 2012 project was one of those projects where you had um, people from all over the world sitting together and um, coming out at the end and saying, yeah, it works, it works. Mm. And it was heartening for me because I spent a lot of time researching the compositions that I did, did an Indian piece as well as the um, sweep of solo steel pan and strings. And audience members from the Asian continent could come and tell me which rag I'd used. And that was heartening that I'd kind of spent the time to research 
And um, there was that resonance with the audience as to what was going on. <laughs> 